Are we? <laughs> oh, I always do it wrong. There we go. Classical Rebellion. Back. After, uh, we haven't been in the Hermitage for months. We've been busy. We've been out and about. We've been out and about. We've been on the town. We have. We've been doing the The Bronx work. is up and the battery's down. That's true. Um, but not the battery in this phone. No, the battery's fully charged. <laughs> the battery's fully charged. And so are our batteries are fully charged. Yeah, I just had I had a, uh, the equivalent, an off-brand Red Bull, so I'm good. <laughs> yes, well, I've been up since 5.30 this morning playing yeah. Masses in Temecula and Vespers in North Park, and we've been all around town. Yes. And we have lots to talk about. We do. Let's backtrack a little. Okay. There we were. I'm going to change our lighting just a little bit. Of this. Yeah. No. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't do it doesn't that. Um, so just make sure you're in the light. There we were. There we go. So we got Back about track. halfway through the festival. We the were there San for the, Diego, mainly Mozart for the guitar concerts. Yeah, I realized I was trying. What I was trying to say in our live spot on that was that, you know, there's something just different about a guitar concerto. It's somewhat rarefied. It's some I, to me it bespeaks, you know, the kind of of particular. Um, musical fans who I mean Segovia used to say you know um, the guitar recital was such when, when he would give a recital one time he was giving a recital on, on the stage at Carnegie Hall and a workman walked right into the middle of it with a ladder because he didn't know anyone was there right you know it's, yeah um, but it's not like an operatic tenor recital no it's something much more particular not everybody's into the guitar you know but I mean not. you're just not but I mean, it's, it's difficult not to be into the guitar when it's played as well as Pepe Romero played it. Yeah. I mean, that was a stunning. Uh, but it's a it's a rarefied beast, and so I wore my knit tie, which is redolent of Oxford intellectualism in the late nineteen forties. I think you know you expect to see a, a knit tie oh, at a meeting between see, the. Oh, I was going more like, um, you know, MTV nineteen eighty two knit tie. <laughs> Well, we each have a different perception of okay. the, the rarefied yeah. atmosphere of a guitar concerto, but it was wonderful, and uh, it was a very interesting concert. Um, and we heard a, a, some remarkable playing of the English horn from mm -hmm. Andre Overturf. Andre Overturf, um, and it was which was quite wonderful. Yes, and I had a chance to uh, remark to her uh, after the. At the last concert of the of the series, the Beethoven Sixth, that um, I, th I think she overheard me telling um, a friend of mine that uh, that was pretty much how I like my Beethoven: crisp, <laughs> forward moving. Yeah, uh, it held together. That the it was wonderfully articulated, but it was the polar opposite of the Beethoven Seventh that started the season San uh, at Symphony. San Diego Symphony, yeah. which just did not work at all. Um, it was. Strung out, disconnected, lacked energy in crucial places, and I think she heard me say that. I think she sort of like looked up at me, like, and I'm like, uh huh. Well, that's how it was. Yeah. But that does not reflect on her playing, which was magnificent. And the English mm -hmm. horn is not something you hear a lot of these days. No, no. She was featured in the uh, what that evening? The Grand Partita. The Grand. No, no, no. Oh, it, oh, the, the, that same evening. The Siegfried Adil. Siegfried Idle, and also the uh, Pavon. The Pavon, yes. Of Ravel. Pour enfant de fond. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like a no-fault divorce. Yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, which was which was lovely to hear. Um, also, but frankly, the Mamère Loire left me... It's an okay piece. It, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it a suite. I'd call it like more like a what unfinished thoughts unfinished thoughts of maurice <laughs> Ravel. <laughs> it did not evoke anything right. like christmas or li I, like a i children's. understand why it was on the program though because it tied in with this idea of uh with rodrigo's concerto the aranjes the aranjes uh as you know he's overcoming the death of a child yes no it makes uh, sense with mozart I think the Kentertoten leader would have gone down a little bit more, you know, relevantly. Sure, it's a, <laughs> not the right size orchestra. Well, now you say that, but I had a call last night from a friend of mine who's going to be playing in. Uh, we're going to look forward here for a second. We're going to be playing in the Summerfest at La Jolla, mm -hmm. and they are going. Well, they're to doing be, a chamber version. They're they? going to be doing the Mahler Four, with about twelve instruments and a harmonium. 
Now, I don't know whose arrangement this is, but I'm fascinated to hear it. I'm not. I am. I mean, because I didn't like the I don't like I don't like the Mahler four. Oh, I do. I, I like the Mahler four very much, and and I also think that um, it is interesting, though. Yeah, it's it's. I I love that first movement, and and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know who I don't know whose reduction it is. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to find out. I'm also curious to hear something like that in the in the Conrad acoustic. I haven't heard it yet, and I'm looking forward to it. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping to maybe be sneaked into a rehearsal um, score in hand, you know, as a you know, up-and-coming young conductor. Um, <laughs> right. Hey, there are other people around this town who've been called up-and-coming young conductors for most of their lives. So true. <laughs> I, I, I'm just up-and-coming right now. Yeah. Until that rehearsal's over, then I'm not up-and-coming anymore. No, then so. you're done. You've yeah, then done I'm done. Up and but I want to hear that. I, I really do, and I, I think that sounds like a really interesting project. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, look. Toscanini at Salzburg, 1937, they're not using a full Wagner Festspiel orchestra for Meister's well, no, it's you know, just because but it's, it only, the pit there only right. sat about 40. Yeah. So it's a, uh, a festival such as the mainly Mozart festival. is not going to do any reductions of anything. No, but I mean, it, not necessarily reductions, yeah. but they're, you know, how do you handle the necessity of paring down an orchestra? I mean that that's something that opera companies have to think sure. about sometimes. I mean, the I mean, first time Von Karajan conducted Meistersinger was with seventeen instruments. That my, that's my point. Yeah. That's my point. That's right. virtually. It can be done. Yeah, and yeah. it can also be made into great music as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's all going to depend on the ensemble and the leadership, the ability so. of the performers, and yeah. So let's talk about ensemble and leadership um, okay. relative to mainly Mozart. Sure. Um, and in terms of what we heard, I had a friend go with me to most of the concerts, mm -hmm. and it was her opinion that a lot of it sounded pretty continually forced in its tempo. I mean, we're going fast because we can go fast, and we're going. And you know, I now sometimes it came off better than others, in my opinion. Um, I mean, I think Michael Francis is a really uh, dynamic conductor. Mm -hmm. He's getting a great response out of it. The question is, does he always have to get that greater response out of it? As far as, you know, is, can, is it possible to have your fingers stuck too far into the electrical socket? I don't think it is. Because uh, I've heard that orchestra play too slowly at times. And it's... It's well, just too slow. Perhaps. I you just know, didn't, it, I didn't hear that this fair, season, I'll that, tell you that. No, you did not. And to be fair, Michael Francis was not conducting the uh, concert I have in mind. Right. Now, uh, and it, also, it the, was, the Beethoven is not, uh, 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 that was a re, is a relaxed symphony. Much of it is very relaxed. Mm -hmm. I, the, 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 the Tempe were still pushed forward into certainly like Norrington territory. Sure. And I like that. I like that. Um, you have to do but, it in live performances, I believe. You cannot. But the piano concerto risk being stagnant. that with, with um, the the second one with um, Conrad Tao. Oh, mm -hmm. Piano concerto number twenty in D minor, Beethoven's favorite. I I I just uh, I'm afraid I didn't agree with many of his interpretive devices. Um, I thought that the first. Concerto that we heard in the season. Number 21 with, with Jeremy Dank. Jeremy Dank um, was absolutely an epitome of, of Mozart on modern instruments. I mean, mm -hmm. that was that was absolutely stunning. Yeah. And again, the tempo pressed forward. It was crisp. It was light. But it, 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 it didn't go too far. I felt like, you know, it was the, he was... Conrad was, and again, I mean, I recognize the brilliance of his playing. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to stamp the floor, maybe put a piece of carpet under your foot. Because, you know, it's, yeah. I don't, I, I need to hear the music. I don't need to hear how much you're feeling it. That's, that's kind of distracting. Uh, it's not adding to the music in any way. Right. And I mean, a couple of times it like snapped up, like you know, it's like did somebody just light off a firecracker on the stage? Really, I mean, it's yeah. like what the hell was that? Um, but I also thought that that example was it was trying to turn it into something Beethovenian, something you yes. know, so declamatory that's, that was un Mozartian. But yeah. 
brilliant but un-Mozartian. That's what was going on. And it's what Beethoven did as well himself, is he, in a lot of ways, was not unconventional. He just did more than Mozart and Haydn within those forms. He did more key changes. Well, he also he had his more. very yeah. own, his very uh, personal uh, um, uh, inner vision of rhetoric and structure that mm -hmm. he didn't follow them. I mean, he definitely built on what they did and altered their structures. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously he became more declamatory and more more idiosyncratic, I think is the word. Right. He was himself. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's yeah. fine, but it's just not. Yeah, the Mozart. cadenzas I thought were I mean they were Beethoven's cadenzas and I thought they were they were emphatically Beethoven's cadenzas. Mm -hmm. And I can I was thinking at the time because of the uh I don't know, the canyon of <laughs> of uh tempo changes, right? So we went from super slow piano to Bang! And it was gone. It's being ultra <laughs> Beethoven. And I could see how some people might have found that to be aggressive. Um, I enjoyed it because it wasn't... I, for me, it detracted from the experience. Mm. Um, I, I, there was a couple of times when I thought, you know, like maybe that the, um, he caught his... The, we, we'd lost a roller from one of the legs on the piano and he caught his foot under the harp, you know, on the pedals. He was like, ah, ow! You know, or something. <laughs> but it was just... Um, and I preferred the, the Dink performance of uh, sure. his style, which was is, uh, I heard somebody say, you know, for crying out loud, he called the piano tuner in four times on the con day of the concert, didn't you, to retune the piano. Really? Apparently so. Okay. Well, if you're going to play it like that, then uh, I guess you're hearing something that, 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 I'm not, that I don't sure. hear because, I, I mean, it, it was a, a model of taste and style. And mm -hmm. uh, he... He just floated in and out of the uh, out of the music so beautifully, and and he wasn't. I mean, okay, yeah. When you're on your game enough to like to occasionally like mug at the audience, like, like that, <laughs> yeah, and to make people smile like that. I mean, because it is playful music as well. I don't find that in in intrusive in the same way as extraneous noises um, and such. Sure, but yeah, I enjoy both of you. Maestro Tao, Maestro Dink, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And, you know, this is, this is quibbling, but that's what that's what we do. We quibble. That's part of the game. That's, we, you know, <laughs> if, if you're fortunate enough to quibble about small yeah. things. Yeah. But, I mean, small things are then, you know, this is that's more for fun. Because when you have to quibble about really large things, that's not fun. That's no fun. That's no fun at all. No. And there's all too much need to quibble about some really big things in the classical yeah. world at the moment. And I appreciated Michael Francis, particularly before the Piano Concerto Number no. Twenty One, uh, talking about the opera B Buffa, as he calls it. Uh, <laughs> it's an opera Buffa. Uh, yes. It's uh, context of the music, and it, it it rang true to me that that opening of the twenty first dun 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 dun. It's like these are characters in search well, that's of. A, a, that sounds like the beginning of Figaro. Bum, yeah, bum, bum, right. But it sounds bum, like bum, figures bum, in search of a you know episode of mistaken identity. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just I was like that. That was brilliant. That was brilliantly essayed. A nice little nail to hang a frame on for the audience who was familiar uh, yeah. with. Not everyone's familiar with Mozart's operas, and unfortunately, but for those of us who are, I I appreciated it. Well, it was a wonderful. It was a wonderful season. Um, I think um, I still have a problem with hearing the Royal Fireworks music on on modern instruments. We're so far into the early music. Into the, I mean, that's a, a whole, you know, two generations earlier than Mozart, and still very much, you know, in the late late baroque early classical crossover period mm -hmm. and that's just not the sound for me i i yeah i just there are certain things that no i mean it's the logistics of getting the sound i know is always i know. An issue. the logistics but why program, the logistics but program of something this festival else. to begin with i know are much more extensive than anyone could oh i know ever I, 
believe. But but if you're gonna like, for instance, and in the Beethoven, if if you if you're going to do a Beethoven symphony with an orchestra the size of what Beethoven wrote it for, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why this was you know a, a re potentially revelatory yeah. sound experience for many many people because it has a very different texture from an a, you know a six a sixty piece. Yeah. You know, when you, when you're talking about thirty five pieces, yeah, that's that, that's a very we have twelve violins, not twenty four. Exactly, it's yeah. a very compact. But if you're going to do that and and do it on modern instruments and aim for the period articulation, there, I mean, there are certain things that are not difficult to accomplish. Like why not use wooden mallets on, on the timpani rather than cotton heads? Because that's one of the features of early music, uh, uh, late, you know. The, the classical early romantic they're still using skin drum heads and wooden mallets and as as we learned from Norrington's essay of the symphonies when you y use those mallets your thunderstorm you know uh sounds like uh drums right off the uh right off the battlefield at waterloo mm -hmm. you know it's a much Harder, you know, right. rattle -ty bang to quote a Gershwinism uh, type of, of of sound, and it works in Beethoven. You know, it jerks you up in your seat. Mm -hmm. I, I, as as a way We've of blending. We've come to the point of talking about wood versus cotton heads. By the way, just <laughs> well, I wanted to work the percussion in there somehow. I mean, I wanted to feel appreciated because it's great, and I wanted to hear it more. I wanted to hear, you know, the like when when a crack of of lightning goes off and it's very close to you, and you don't get the you know the forewarning rumble you mm -hmm. get bam yeah. that's what i want to hear in a Be beethoven thunderstorm yeah so things like that you know yeah. it, we definitely heard the wind the well, wind blowing. sorry about that the, i mean I, wind, yeah. I, I went out to dinner <laughs> i know it was it was quite embarrassing it was windy it was, it was, um it no i mean everything from the the, the rippling brook to yeah. the and i thought that the tempo for the uh for the um, the German beer garden hoedown, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. was fabulous. Yeah. I mean, those those peasants were rollicking. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I was rollicking yeah. with them. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. That was a wonderful moment. I, I really enjoyed hearing that. And I hope they continue to do Beethoven symphonies with, with that group. I'm sure. Um, Especially coming into this. Beethoven's 250th birthday. Please birth use wooden mallets. Yeah, Beethoven's 250th birthday is not until... December sixth, I think, twenty twenty. So it's a full okay, year so. and a half away. But we are going to be getting Beethoven two hundred and fiftieth starting in the autumn of this year. And it should carry on through and it'll carry, so we're into, getting a into year the and next half. year. Yeah, we're yeah. getting a year and a half of Beethoven. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And uh, in honor of that, I'm reading a Beethoven biography, which I'm enjoying thoroughly. Which one? The uh... Swafford. Swafford. Jan Swafford. Hmm. I read his Brahms. It was good. So I. Got his Beethoven. Who's the cl the class the, the classic oh, Beethoven yeah. biography? It's there's the one. Uh, yeah. It's I the equivalent remember. of Spitta on Bach. Um, the know. big two volume biography yeah. that was written back in the. He 19th mentioned century. it, but I didn't. Yeah, I, I can't remember. This author it mentioned it. That it's... I've always meant to read that. Yeah. Maybe I'll read it this year. Maybe this would be the year. <laughs> this would be the year. You know, it's not often you get that opportunity. It's what uh, something I've thought about in the operas I've been in over the years is how unique the opportunity is to be in on the inside of the music. Oh, absolutely. Music. Absolutely it is. And this is such a unique opportunity because we're going to be getting so much Beethoven. I mean, I've looked at the schedule. There's, I think we're getting basically two, three, four, five, and six. Maybe not five. We're next, at San Diego season, Symphony at this, San Diego Symphony. this yeah. season? Plus, well, uh, the if, violin if mainly Mozart next year can work in, oh, you I'm know, sure. seven or eight... You yeah. know, or I mean, maybe maybe nine. But I don't know. Maybe seven love, or eight. I love Beethoven's fourth. I really enjoy it. I've been listening to it quite a bit lately. Four and eight. I've been doing a four and eight thing because they're so neglected. You're one of those evens guys. No, the third is still my favorite. <laughs> um, he's one of those. That's very but, very Seinfeld as he's one of those even, even symphony yes, listeners. He's an you know? even. Yeah, he's an he's even an guy. evener. He's evenish. Um, four and eight are great. Well, you didn't. Did you go to the eighth at the San Diego Symphony? Uh, 
I don't, I don't remember. I, don't, I think you I might have missed you, that. You were going to go. That was the, the finale. No, what I was going to say, though, is I, I really I really hope that no one does the Misa Solemnus, though. I hate that. It's like his worst piece. It's like, it's just terrible. Don't do it. I would go hear it. I wouldn't. If it was a full-on opera company oh, producing God. it. It's it would be great. It's because the Placido Domingo awful. with James Levine on Deutsche Grammophon is a fantastic performance. It's like, I love it. It's great. It's but like it's the only one. All of the vocalisms that are wrong about the Ninth Symphony that work so well, just because the Ninth Symphony is the Ninth, ninth Symphony, mm -hmm. are just magnified in their wrongness in a different situation where they really don't yeah. work. Oh, um, I don't want to sing it. <laughs> I don't just, want to sing the ninth either. I don't want to do the tenor solos in the ninth. It's just cacophony. And yeah. I'm just like, yeah. yeah. It's the polar opposite of the Bach B minor mass. It's the polar opposite of the B minor mass. I mean... I'm not a big fan of Bach's choral writing either. I think well, the, but the thing is that shows, the B minor mass... Uh, uh, it shows, in my opinion, only on the tenor line, because that's all I ever sing, either a disregard for or an ignorance of the registration of the human voice. Well, and so does Beethoven. Well, Beethoven, it's not so much registration, it's the way he uses the voice. He's got like sostenudos as if they're a clarinet screaming on a high note that you can do that on a clarinet, but you do that on a voice long enough, you're going to kill somebody. Yeah. And it, but I mean, look, in, in really large mass settings, you've got the B minor mass, You've got the Haydn Schöpfung Messe. You've got the, uh, the the Misa Solemnus, probably the Berlioz Requiem and the Verdi Requiem. Those are like f the five pillars of overblown sized masses. Okay. And the B minor, the um, the Schöpfung, even though it's it's like the glorious like. 40 minutes or something like that. It's well, huge. It's, it's I, I've long, actually heard it. I've actually heard it in the liturgy an hour in hour. London. It's huge. The mass yeah. is huge. But somebody paid for it, so they did it. And, and it, But it's Haydn. It works. He writes well. And the, you know, the Verdi, it's not liturgical, but it works well. I mean, it's a it's great piece of music. It, it's it, the best for the singers. It rocketh. he understands the registration of the human voice. It rocketh valde, I, to, to put the Latin for it. Just, I can't, Nimis. I can't remember what's near the end, but there's just this one part where we do this. Uh, the tenors have a descending third, I think. Ad lux per petua. Mm -hmm. And I just teared up so hard in rehearsal. It was <laughs> perfect. I remember Carol Neblet doing it with the San Diego um, Opera. Uh, we did a Verdi Requiem. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Dennis O'Neill sang the tenor part and I don't know. Uh, he's a Welsh tenor I heard mm. him sing the oh. uh, Dream of Gerontius in St. Paul's Cathedral in London in the City of London Festival back around 2002 okay. it was stunning anyway um, this is in the Liberame where you know it, you do the octave up to the top B Nash Liberame they have to yeah. float that yeah. and Carol didn't quite float it the way she might have mm. in that particular... And she was coming back into singing. She hadn't sung for a while. Anyway, she did it. But you know what? Neither did Zinka Milanoff at the War Bond concert with Toscanini. She brought like half the chorus in with her about a half, two bars early. Yeah. She just like touched it and then scrambled it back in and like drank. <laughs> that's why they never issued the recording. Really? Like, couldn't, huh. couldn't sort it out. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, that, that's how treacherous that piece is. But yes. it's also fundamentally vocal. Yeah. Nevertheless, I mean, the Berlioz Requiem, I, I imagine, works well enough on its own. Um, Once again, not for the tenors. The first tenor part is, for all intents and purposes, the alto part, because there is no alto part. Well, I counted it up. There were under over 300 pitches above the staff for the first tenor. But it's probably it's I'm I've never really studied it, but it's probably typically eccentric in the Berliozian manner. But one thing's for sure, you know, if the first tenor the, line is an alto line, yeah, that's what it is. Again, I'm, I'm are they? I hate tenor 
choral parts. Well, everybody's except the, for listen, the Verdi Requiem. Everybody's always got a weird part. Every composer, right, there, there's that one part that they write last, and with with Bach, but, it's usually the alto part. It's like he's got a, altos always yeah, have a might, weird line. They might in have Bach. a weird line, but they're not being yanked across their registration constantly. Well, wouldn't they be countertenors in Berlioz's day? Possibly. No, they wanted for to for choralists. Been, I would they imagine they wouldn't have been singing an octave higher. That Brahms bears, as well. The Brahms Requiem, that bears ridiculous. Well, they have, but that's not really. Ridiculous. It's not really. I right. love it. It's not really a Requiem, though. I mean, yeah, sure. it's an, it's, that's an oratorio. The German Requiem. It's an oratorio. I mean, but it's, which is, and it's lovely. I love listening to it. Uh, but my God, the tenor. <laughs> just don't do the Misa Solemnis. <laughs> Avoid the discussion. Just don't do it. I sound like such a curmudgeon about this stuff, but. I'm not a poor singer. <laughs> and when I'm trying to back off and survive a piece and I'm failing at it, <laughs> cons- predominantly I'm talking about the Brahms Requiem here, it, it's frustrating. It's like, man, like either the, the style of singing has become so far removed and I, there's really no way of telling. I don't know how much pedagogy we, we have from the 19th century it's like I say, every every composer has a weird part. Mm-hmm. There's a part that, that they write last, and that's what it has to do. Now, why he didn't write an alto well, part? It sounds very right. pianistic to me. Like, he's like, well, this works fine on the piano. Very possibly. Yeah. Just like Beethoven tends to sound very, very instrumental. You know, he's, you know, he's asking the voices to sustain things in ways that only an instrument would do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he gets away with it better in Fidelio, although Fidelio, that brings up a whole other point of discussion, there, there is no way in hell <laughs> that, the te- that Florestan should be, ever be John Vickers. It's a countertenor part. It's, it's, it's a light head voice tenor. He's starving. He's not a hero. There's only one hero in an opera, not two, and it ain't Florestan. It's Lenora. She's the hero in 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 Fidelio. Hmm. You can only have one hero. He's, well, he's weak. fantastic he's been... on that aria, though. It's but so it's not. But, but it, <laughs> it is so when it works. Thrilling. But I've heard more tenors gag on it than ever uh, of got course. it right. Yeah. But that's, but that's because what makes it's... the the John Vickers so thrilling. Is well, yeah, but be thrilling. I mean, when when you get right down to it, though, that's just Same not the way Peter it's supposed Grimes, to be. He's... That's not the way it's supposed yeah. to be. It's he's the Floristan. In dramatically my or vocally. And he's the Peter Grimes, and neither of those. And I'm still waiting for somebody to record that correctly and get a Floristan who is. Oh, I'm sure the Jesus Sandaled period people will do it at some point. I would hope so. They don't like opera, though. <laughs> well, maybe they do. They're always stuck in a Monteverdi. I want to hear a Floristan who sounds like he's actually like about to die. Hmm. You want that from the chorus as well? The... Well, their chorus, chorus isn't really as... The Prisoner's as, Chorus. Their chorus isn't as... It's a fantastic um, piece. It's a great piece. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I will but, say this. Um, I find... So I've done Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, Dutchman. There is a... The opening of the second act of Tannhäuser, the entrance of the nobles, is a son of a bitch. For the first tenors. But everything else... Is easier than Brown Truck Wim. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you, uh, well, some, I've done I've, yeah. I've done Lohengrin and and uh, and Fidelia or Lohengrin and, and Dutchman, mm-hmm. and I, I remember finding them quite singable. That was a long time ago. But... I loved singing Lohengrin. I loved one, it. The Act One finale of Lohengrin is just a romp. It's so much fun. So is the Act Two. But you, you get almost, well, Aida, you get this opportunity as well, but to be very pianissimo, expressive, reverent, mm-hmm. sacred in Lohengrin, and then you just get a scream as well. <laughs> you know, like you have this massive range of expression for the chorus, which you don't yeah. always get. You, eh, you get it maybe more often than I'm giving composers credit for, because you get that in Faust, you get that in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, you get that in Carmen. I've never not seen as it. much never, in Carmen. I've never sung the choruses much... in Romeo and Juliet. Oh, it's that's fun. I was Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, but I, I don't oh, know. I don't. You I, weren't in the chorus. I, I, I don't yes. know the choruses. Yeah. I only knew my part. I mean, the rest of it was. Right. Yeah. Now the third act. Uh, I'd like to see it sometime. After Romeo kills Mercutio, or no, kills um, Tybalt, mm-hmm. that whole scene for the chorus is phenomenal. 
It's so good. Hmm. So much fun. We all get to sing the big tune. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love it. Well, so looking forward, um, have you looked at the schedule for Summerfest? I had, I received the uh, the brochure in the mail. Mm-hmm. And Apart I, from I the model, I really it. don't. No, we'll we'll have to bone up on that and and see. Uh, maybe in our next podcast, we'll do the breakdown on uh, on what they've got coming up. Yeah. But I can tell you, I'm looking forward to the Mahler, and uh, just for, it's eccentric, but maybe it'll maybe it'll actually hold together. Yeah, and hopefully it depends th- on the abilities of the players. I mean, they're going to be super exposed. There's no way for them not to be. No, but I wonder. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm wondering whether there might be like a um, you know a sextet of strings and then a few woodwinds yeah. thrown in or if it's because the harmonium yeah, the woodwinds are always exposed. the harmonium part <laughs> is is actually designed to, to to provide some of the string parts so i think it might and they can have a soul uh, the vocal oh i'm sure they will you have to have this have to have this vocalist yeah. soprano solo hmm. so i don't know who that is yet but right. we'll be bringing that to you in our next installment yes yeah, let's do this consistently. That's supposed to be the key to success for these kinds of things. Well, Thursday nights is good for me. Okay, let's um, do Thursday nights. I think nights. we're going to aim for thir- a Thursday night. Not this night. Thursday, it's the 4th of July. Well, no, but we're getting this weekend. So. Oh, this is this, this, this is this Thursday. Yes, this can go out on Thursday. This okay. will be our special. Ta, 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 Sport, this is our 4th of just July. Realized, I just I texted a friend and said, hey, because my uh, I'm off this week. Uh, from mainly Mozart, and my kids are going to visit my parents in Idaho. They're playing there with my sister, and I was like, "Huh, I got nothing to do this week." So I texted a friend. I said, "Hey, you know, wh- what's your schedule like?" And they were like, "Oh, I'm free on Thursday and Friday." <laughs> and I was like, "Me? T-. She's Mexican." I was like, "Me too." Like, awesome. You know, let's do something. Not realizing I had no Fourth of July plans <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> hmm. I think we may uh, go over and stake out a place in Coronado for the uh, and have a breakfast cookout. Oh, for the uh, for the Coronado Fourth of July parade, which mm-hmm. is always great fun. Yeah, that's a big one. And um, and don't the the don't they do some kind of beach landing as well during the day? Maybe, but not not on Orange Avenue. No, <laughs> I'm sure a hovercraft could get there. So. <laughs> they probably could. <laughs> Might take out a few front yards. Yeah. On it. Right. <laughs> Coming through yeah. Star Last Park. Last I heard, they could they could cl- it could clear a five foot obstacle. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. This. All duck. Yes, duck. 